I'm Ken Adams, and this is a special edition of the Valley View, where we're interviewing various city council candidates. And joining me today is Tom Anderson. Welcome to the show, Tom. Hi, Ken. <laughs> How you doing? Thanks for inviting me. Well, I, I really want to make sure that Salem gets to see the candidates, and kind of in a more informal but kind of in-depth kind of discussion. That sounds good to me. Okay. And I wanted to start it off like I have with the other candidates talking about the third bridge because I, I think it's kind of an important issue in the fact that it's been kind of talked about, but people don't understand it very well, in, in my view. Well, let me start off by saying, uh, Ken, my view is we ought to improve the bridges we have, and by improving those bridges, we will go a long way to solve the problem, which is, uh, getting from West Salem to East Salem in the morning for about uh, 30 minutes congestion and in the afternoon from getting from downtown to um, uh, West Salem. And the solution that is proposed for the third bridge is, remember, we've got maybe a 20 to 30 minute um, delay or congestion in the morning. So the Congestion is not usually a delay. No, <laughs> congestion, I would, I'd agree, congestion. So the solution to that is to get in your car and drive 10 minutes north, almost to Kaiser, then cross a bridge that is uh, twice as long as the span of the Brooklyn Bridge, the main span of the Brooklyn Bridge, over the alluvial floodplain of the Willamette, which is very unstable in earthquakes, and then drive 10 minutes south, all over new roads. And that will cost, by various estimates, 400 million to 600 million, and as all public works projects do, they increase. So. The money is going to come not from the federals. There'll be little or no money coming from the feds, not from the state. There's little or no money that can come from the state, not from Marion or Polk counties, both of which has said we're not paying for it, not from Kaiser, which has said that. It's going to come from the citizens of Salem, and the way that's going to happen is either property taxes or gas taxes or even uh, tolls on the bridge. And uh, all that money is going to be spent, and it's not going to solve the problem, which is getting from one side of Salem to the other side of Salem in the morning and the afternoon. Now, there are other ways to solve that problem. The uh, first thing is to say, uh, um, fix the on-ramps and the off-ramps of the bridge. Many years ago, I think it was 98 or 2000, some point in that area, some time in that area, a study was done saying here are 8 to 10 things you can do to fix the bridge on the oh, on these yeah. east end. Yeah, and both ends, east end yeah. and west end. Some of those have been done, some of them haven't. If we feel like we need to spend money on a bridge for a uh, 100 to 150 million dollars, which is alternative 2A, we can retrofit earthquake proof both bridges. We can add one lane going one way and two lanes going the other way and change the off-ramp configuration and that'll resolve the problem. Now, uh, uh, that's well, you're going to have to retrofit anyway, uh, or you really should anyway. Yeah, yeah, of course you should. And so instead of, uh, but right now in the plans for the new bridge, there's no plans to retrofit earthquake-proof the bridges. We so, have. so you could have a situation where the third bridge is up and the the main center Marion sure. Street bridges are of down. Of course you could. Of course you could. And um, that's just looking at it from. Uh, 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 an engineering point of view, but if you also look at it from what's happened uh, in West Salem, yes, there's been growth in West Salem, but if you look at any chart from about 2000 to the present, the growth, say, I'm, I'm, this is rough, of course, the growth might have gone up like this in West Salem, but you look at the traffic flow coming across the bridge, it has remained relatively stable. So it's a fallacy to say that increased population equals increased traffic. So I think it's a waste of, of, of time and money and energy, and it doesn't even solve the problem that it was set to address. I have another creative way that could potentially solve this problem, Ken. Uh, solve would be too strong, but it helped ameliorate the problem. And that is, look at the biggest employer in, uh, in the city of Salem. It's the state government. Right. They pay very little in taxes, if any, to us for the property they have and other things they use. Why couldn't the city of Salem approach uh, uh, the employer, biggest employer, the state of Oregon, and say, look, we have a mutual problem in getting our citizens and of the city and the people who work for you over the bridge on rush hours. So why can't we start the Department of Transportation at 8 o'clock in the morning? 
Why can't we start forestry at 815? Why can't we start revenue at 830? And just by spreading those out, we've spread out the, the, the peak flows of traffic. And mm -hmm. you know, that's the thing that can be done without spending any money. Well, that would be a good solution then. Because one of the solutions I keep thinking about is, is since the, it's kind of really a small time frame that you're talking about, you could, you could run shuttle buses across. Well, you certainly could. There's a couple other things too. Um, you know, there's a big uh, parking lot there at uh, Wallace Marine Park. Right. And why can't you allow people to park there, get some sort of permit system, and people who work downtown, who work at the Capitol Mall, they can walk across the river on the bike bridge. Right. Uh, there's another uh, thought that's out there too that is way in the uh, planning stages now, but there is the possibility of having some sort of streetcar system that could run in a, uh, a, you know, an oval on the west side of the river and then cross the bike bridge on the top of the bridge because, as you know, the land slopes down there kind of to go to the bike bridge right. and then come down on the other side of Liberty and Commercial and then have a loop there that would go through downtown all the way out to, to the, capital? the capital and through Willamette and come back. And that sort of project does have federal money available for it. Up to 80% oh, okay. of that could be, could be supported by the feds. And that's a much better solution, I yeah, think. Yeah, of course. Um, so I am I, I'm, I'm definitely in favor of improving what we have, but I am not in favor of uh, a, a spendthrift uh, uh, bridge. Well, to me, it's probably benefiting certain people that don't have traffic congestion in mind. Yeah. At least that's my view, and well, we'll let it go with that. Well, you know, well let's, let's go a little further, because okay. I say when I'm talking to people, I say the people that I know or the groups that I know that are in favor of it for the most part, the Chamber of Commerce, which is a regional Chamber of Commerce. It's not, not the Salem the area Chamber of Commerce. So, for example, the casinos in the Chamber of Commerce. The, the casino oh, Grand Ronde. Yeah, yeah, Grand Ronde. And the developers. And, you know, there's money to be made when you've got a new bridge bringing people there. And it also helps people get from basically I-5 to the coast a little, a little faster. Not but it much, doesn't but help downtown bit. Salem at all. Yeah, and, and when I first moved here to Salem, I used to substitute at various schools in the mm -hmm. Dallas School District mm -hmm. and some other places. And so I'd be going across the bridge at those times, yeah. and I didn't consider it no. a, a, an issue, really. No. I mean, I had to slow no, down. I, I, never, I never, ever had to stop. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I'm from Chicago. I grew up in <laughs> Chicago, so... You know, what's yeah. 20 minutes, 30 minutes? Well, yeah. yeah, and I lived in Sacramento where you have a lot of issues with bridges yeah. and, and rivers and like that. And then you would definitely be stopped on the bridges yeah. for quite some period of time, yeah. not just slowing down. Yeah. So that, that to me is why, I, you know, I, I couldn't understand it to start with. No. But the other big kind of infrastructure issue that I see is the location of the police department. Yeah. And there's some talk about moving it. And so what... and also, they would have to then also retrofit uh, City Hall where it is in the library. Sure. And I'm very proud of that library. That is an exceptional library as far as I'm concerned. Listen, I check books on tape <laughs> out of there all the time. But so, so what is your view on what should happen with the uh, well, Civic Center? Well, let me talk a little bit on a systemic view of this. And I think the whole Civic Center process is endemic of how uh, City Hall has been operating the past several years. And uh, this is a theme that resonates quite clearly with people when I'm out canvassing. I was out tonight before we came in here. And it seems like uh, the people, uh, the city hall, and I'll just lump it that way, spends a lot of time, Ken, making decisions up here at the top and then spends a lot more time trying to convince you and me down here at the bottom that it was a good idea. So my th campaign theme is elected neighborhood leader come from the bottom up, not the top down. And the Civic Center situation is a, a prime example of this. As I understand it, uh, several years ago, um, the University of Oregon uh, graduate students in many disciplines came up to Salem for a year project called Sustainable Cities. And I was chair of, uh, president of SCAN neighborhood when that happened. And they were very helpful with us in developing ideas for the Liberty uh, commercial couplet, making it more people friendly, more pedestrian family uh, friendly, a uh, place where you would want to be as opposed to a place where you just come through. 
<coughs> excuse me, I got a bad cold. All that campaigning. Yeah, <laughs> and talking. And another group of students was told by the people at City Hall that we need to build, to retrofit City Hall and to build a new police station on the footprint of the Civic Center that's already there. So they weren't told, we need, to exp we need a new police station, let's explore What other the alternatives options. are. Yeah. And I, I, I clearly am in favor of a new police station. Uh, we can't have our first responders <laughs> in a building that's going to collapse on it's them. It's going to pancake on them, um, yes. But I'm not in favor of the project as proposed, and I don't think very many people are. For one thing, the new, the, the new police uh, station part of it would uh, uh, cause Mirror Pond, which is the lovely little park north of uh, the City, City Hall. Hall, to be drained, and then the, the, the station itself four to five stories would be basically over Mirror Pond or the old Mirror Pond and kind of athwart the, the path along the river. And it might not be a total physical barrier, but it certainly would be a psychological barrier. And it's another example of what I see lack of a coherent vision in uh, the city as it's run right now because they're emphasizing, let's get to the river, let's the Minto Brown Bridge, the uh, you know, getting rid of the foolish project for an apartment complex right by the carousel and said make it a park. But in so doing, putting the police station there, it's going to block the flow of traffic, as it were. Mm -hmm. So I'm in favor of a new police station. I'm in favor of, of um, retrofitting everything that's down there. I'm not in favor of moving the uh, council chambers. I think we c they can be built to look better interior. <laughs> okay. I mean, I think it's pretty bad for the counselors to be down in the pit and everybody looking at them, uh, which is the way the city hall yeah. is set now. But I think what we need is I think the city council uh, needs to clearly articulate its goals for this project. Then I think we really have to go out to the public and obtain their input. I know there's been many, many sites that have been suggested, and I have one in mind myself which may or may not work, but I don't know because we haven't really looked at it. Uh, in great detail, uh, the old Lithia uh, O'Brien uh, the car, car dealership. dealership, which is moving out to the parkway. There's a couple acres there, I would mm -hmm. guess. Plenty of parking and ba service bays and buildings that might be able to be retrofitted. So I think there's some creative ways we can do this and spend a lot less money. Yeah, and you know, talking about how the city council operates currently, I think is also brought home by the downtown parking situation. Oh, yeah. Um, that, and, and this is the way I saw it, is, is that the city comes up with this idea that they're going to start charging, um, going to install meters downtown. Yeah. And the business community, which thought that they had contracted with the city to get free parking. $340,000 a year. Yeah, right. Uh, got upset, went out, got an initiative, and it panicked. This is the way I look at it. Panicked this current city council into just adopting the initiative without thinking about the ramifications. Yes. And now you have a much worse situation oh, yeah. as far as yeah. downtown parking is concerned. And but that to me kind of shows what you were talking yeah. about about not going out to the community and trying yes. to figure out something from the ground up, yeah. and making sure that all the voices are heard. So, because you know when you get stuff from the the top down. Yeah. Quite often they don't look at certain things. No, no. It never even because occurs to them. It's it's a pyramid. From the top of the yes. pyramid, they have no perspective on what's really going on on the bottom. Right. Um, from my point of view, if I were a cynic, and I'm not a cynic because I'm spending all this time running for a job that doesn't pay anything and is going to take 15 <laughs> to 20 hours a week, but uh, 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 one could think that the council panic is one word to say it, but another word sort of to me. Um, you know, I might even say kind of in a fit of pique, said, okay, you know, you don't want what we proposed, we'll do what you, and we'll show you. And, and, and make them, make it painful. Yes. And so, again, if one were a cynic, and I'm not, I don't believe I was this. trying to be polite. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so a year from now, or two years from now, when it's not working because they haven't enforced it, they can say, see, we were right all along. We need to go to paid parking. So here's what I think. I think that the people who live and work and shop downtown ought to have a, the strongest voice in what goes on. 
Um, I think that the city ought to enforce its ordinance, and I'm thinking two, twofold. One, the people who live downtown. There are 100 plus people who live downtown who now have no control, uh, you know, there's no control over where they can park. I mean, they can park anywhere, unlimited. Right. And then, <coughs> excuse me, the people who work downtown, it used to be that the city uh, required every uh, uh, employer employer to say, here are the people who work for me, and here's their car, car license numbers. Right. And if they didn't, they faced a $250 fine. Well, that's voluntary now. So how many people work downtown? 200, 300, 500? You put all those people on it, and, uh, and of course it's hard to, it becomes harder to find a space. So here's my view of it. I think the city ought to do everything they can to make sure that uh, everything is done to have free parking a success. And I think the ordinance ought to be tweaked. I think two hours was too short of a time. You right. can't go to lunch, go shopping. Go to the friends, movies. Go to the mo You can't do anything in two hours. But I would say I would favor, say, maybe a four-hour time, uh, uh, you know, which would right. be enough time to have a nice lunch, go to the movies, go shopping, take a walk, uh, you know, see what's in downtown Salem, which is a very, can be a very active and vibrant place. So I think the ordinance ought to be tweaked a bit. Yeah, and, and I noticed the difference right away when I was going through downtown, even early in the morning, mm -hmm. most of the parking place would be filled up. Yeah. I also have a friend that's uh, disabled and can't walk a long distances, mm -hmm. and he won't go downtown anymore yeah. because yeah. it's just, he can't find any parking places close enough to where he needs to go. Well, I'm kind of on the other side of the spectrum there because I ride my bike most every place, so yeah. I've got places to park downtown, although well, yeah. they need to have, they need to be more bike friendly down there. Well, yes, and, and see, like, I live close enough that I can walk or bike, mm -hmm. but one of the things that I'm bothered by is the lack of enforcement yeah. for bike pedestrian and skateboard safety downtown. Yeah. And I, I can talk a little bit about the situation where I live, which is at near the corner of 17th and Chemeketa. Sure. And we had um, a visually impaired person that was hit in that intersection. I read that in the paper. Yeah, yeah, I thought he was dead when I went out there. Yeah. I really thought he was yeah. dead. And they came out like a few weeks later yeah. and did a enforcement action. We haven't yeah. seen them since. Yeah. And the people coming down 17th, and I'll, I'll say this to the, you folks out there yeah. that drive down 17th, don't play chicken with pedestrians yeah. because yeah. that's really what they're doing. They're yeah. trying to force the they're pedestrian. They're trying to make the light at State Street too. Yeah, but you know, I, I don't think that's usually what's going on. I think they, they just don't want to stop, period. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, there's a few people that do, but yeah. there's a lot of people that just don't want to stop. Well, you know, um, uh, I was asked to run for city council by a group of uh, progressive Democrats in the city and they had seen the things I had done in my eight years of leadership in the SCAN neighborhood and one of the things we worked on a lot were bicycle and pedestrian access. Uh, that's very important because people in our neighborhood again live close enough to walk downtown. Mm -hmm. uh, and for example, uh, I was the leader of SCAN when the hospital bought the school for the blind and we had a lot of contention around that and I was able to bring a neighborhood group together to come up with six different proposals that we wanted to see in that development. Then we approached the hospital as good neighbors. We worked right. with the hospital and the hospital now has adopted five out of those six plans uh, in their final plan and one of them was a pedestrian bike access along Church Street. You wonder how he's going to connect this yes. into, <laughs> in, into pedestrians and bikes from Bush's Pasture Park to Pringle Park, which is the last, you know, uh, greenway that's not there. And the hospitals agreed to dedicate 30 feet uh, 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 on the east side of Church Street to get bikes and pedestrians from Bush's Park, where you can ride through it rather and ride and walk through it rather easily, but then you have a problem right there at Church Street. And so um, that'll help get bikes and people downtown. Well, that's good. Okay. Um, you know, the North Campus, I know that's mm -hmm. not your area, but I mean, that's another thing that I see the city not getting information from the local yeah, yeah. community. Well, I would say au contraire, Ken, oh, because okay. North Campus is in Ward 2. Ward 2 ends at D Street oh, at okay. the north end of North Campus. And I already talked a little bit about, about my uh, experiences with uh, School for the Blind, which is the same thing. State declares it surplus, gives it to DAS to sell. And Early on in this, in fact, before I was even at a candidate for council, uh, I got on an email chain about people who were worried, and I wrote them and said, look, 
I was the chair of SCAN. I was the chair of the Land Use Committee when this was going on. I have some expertise and experience I might be able to share with you. So I've had three meetings with the neighbors out there, and we've discussed things, and we, they've come up with bullet points. And um, uh, I've been, um, I think I've been helpful in, in having them, how they have to deal with any development there. I've also been involved in discussions of a potential for um, a community land trust there. And there are some very serious people who are behind this. And I think the neighbors, it, that has a chance, the land trust, but I think the neighbors need to speak often and clearly and coherently and concisely about what they want to see in that development. And the more they do that, the more chances it'll happen. Mm -hmm. So I look forward on city council to using my expertise to help the state, the city, and some sort of private developer um, come to uh, a mixed-use development of some kind that will serve the needs of the people there uh, and, and will serve the needs of the city. You know, one of the, the issues that kind of bothers me that doesn't get addressed very often is the situation with the homeless. Mm -hmm. And I went to a, a forum that they had back in December, or February, I guess it was, um, talking about the homeless situation. Do you have any thoughts about what could be done? Yes, uh, um, I, I think, um, first of all, uh, again, this is the systemic overall view. People aren't homeless because they want to be homeless. People are homeless because either they've run into hard circumstances in their life due to their uh, sometimes addiction, sometimes mental illness, many, many more times uh, they cannot make it in what American society has become uh, because of, the, again, the 1%, 99% split. So I, I think we need to stop looking at them as anything other than human beings, just like you and I, who need our help at this particular point. Um, I belong to a church that has uh, had um, a homeless family that's in transitional stage live, uh, you know, a continuous succession of them live in our parking lot, uh, um, you know, until they, and they're on their way from living in the streets to living in our parking lot in a secured place and then moving on to some kind of housing. So I think we really need to look at the city doing everything it can to partnership with churches, with the, um, the mission and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Salvation Army and other or or organizations that are already in place. Um, and I think uh, uh, we need to do whatever we can to come up with some sort of permanent housing solution for people. When I was in Eugene for six years, I was on the Joint Housing Commission. And what our goal, our purpose was, was to, using money from various sources, buy up properties and then develop low-income housing on that property. And that would be an idea we might be able to uh, uh, start with Salem. But I think we've always need to look at these people as human beings, as people who have the same amount of worth and value uh, as you and I have. You know, it, it's interesting because um, sometimes I'm going down like 12th Street and mm -hmm. they have those little Zoe cottages yeah, yeah. over near the nursery there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And City of Salem doesn't allow those yeah. to be put in your backyard for like mother-in-law quarters yeah, or something yeah, yeah, like yeah. that. It seems like we should have maybe a, a little village of those things yeah. so oh, that I people agree. can it was some sort of transitional housing so that people do have like a permanent address yeah. because you know I've had friends that have been homeless and, yeah. and they spend a, a lot of energy getting food yeah and, and the basic activities of, of right. daily living and then what energy do they have to look for a job and if they don't have how can they get dressed up if they don't have or take a shower, shower and yeah. shave yeah. and <coughs> so or get mail or get mail. Yeah. So, so those are, you know, things that the city could be helping with. Yes. And, and I guess, you know, I also look at the fact that, like, with the third bridge, you're building infrastructure as if energy is always going to be cheap. Yeah, yeah. And you, that's not really looking ahead. No. And we have a few minutes left, and sure. I, I've discussed the issues that I really like to talk about, but yeah. I, I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about issues that you think are important that need okay. to be addressed. Sure. Um, uh, as I said earlier, I was asked to run by a bunch of progressive Democrats in Salem, and at first I said no, and then I said maybe, and finally I said yes. And they've been very supportive of me um, 
we meet every week at my house, about 10 to 12 people to plan the campaign. Um, my basic theme is um, we need leadership from the bottom up, not from the top down, and we should elect a neighborhood leader. And I've had eight years of experience in the neighborhood working with various arms of the city, so I think I'm prepared to do this. Um, I have three uh, main planks in my platform excuse me, platform. First one is we need transparency in all levels of government. We need to follow the spirit of the Oregon Open Meeting Law, not just the letter. Too often, council decisions are nine to nothing or eight to nothing with not much, to, not much discussion, which tells me that the public meeting forum is not where the decisions are being made. And Funny. so <laughs> I think we need a transparency at all levels of government. The more open the government is, the better it is. Second thing, I think we need to take a realistic look at the budget shortfalls that we're going to be suffering in the next um, decade, let's say. And we've been suffering from that. Yes, and we can't just kick it on down the road and right. then it's going to hit us in the face and we're in real trouble. So I think we need to look at all aspects of the budget creatively. And I may be quite a little wrong a little bit on the percentage, but I think the police and fire are about 80% of the city budget. And... Uh, one uh, idea that I have is that why can't we consolidate the fire and emergency services department of Kaiser and Salem? Um, doing so, instead we would get rid of, instead of two layers of mid-level management and upper-level management, we'd have one. <coughs> I don't think anybody cares if their house is burning down. They want somebody yeah, taking care of it. they don't care if it's a Kaiser yeah. fire. So I think we can look at that. And then I think we can look at at um, uh, scrutiny to the same aspect of these budgets, which are very important and vital, public safety and fire protection. But I'm wondering, do we need to have big Tahoe SUV units when there might be some other hybrid SUVs that would be just, work just as well? Uh, do we need to send a hook and ladder truck out every time someone thinks they might have a heart attack as opposed to a smaller van? I think we can look creatively at the solution then I think we have to look at some potential of other user fees for the city. And I think it's, it's politically expedient and short-sighted to not even look at those, and I pledge to look at that. The third thing, a platform of, of, of main part of my platform, is I think we need to create a sustainability commission in Eugene, uh, Eugene excuse me, in, as they have in Eugene, Eugene, that would advise the city council on all issues that affect the city because uh, that goes back to your about growth is, is good and inevitable and everything's going to grow and we're always going to have cars, et cetera. I think we need to plan to the city for what we do today will be sustainable for your children and my children and our grandchildren as we move out into the future of Salem. Right. Um, it's been very successful in Eugene and I think it could be successful here. So uh, finally, I can see we're running out of time. I think we need a new food card ordinance. I, Ordinance. I think food carts in downtown Salem would just revitalize it. I've talked about the North Campus. Uh, so those are my issues. But I uh, want to also say that in my work at, at, as a neighborhood group, I've been a consensus builder, and I know I can do that at City Council. Well, I want to thank you, Tom, for coming in. I'm and glad to do this it. has been a special edition of the Valley View. And come back next time. We'll have a new City Councilman to talk about various issues. Thank Bye you. Now. Thank you.